everybody in and sit down. We have a special treat. Come on in, sit down. Our uh, speaker, uh, and it's really a pleasure this morning and a pleasant good morning to everyone. That it's nice to have an opportunity to introduce our speaker uh, coming up because uh, uh, as I uh, reflect back on a number of years, uh, I can remember uh, with our speaker sitting right down and listening to other coaches and uh, in other words, he's one of us. Uh, I came up uh, I'm not only a San Jose State graduate, uh, a graduate assistant there, um, and then moved into high school. He was a high school football coach for three years. Then over to the University of California, and uh, uh, from there to Stanford uh, with the Los Angeles Raiders now, then, then the Oakland Raiders, even had a year of semi-pro uh, football, and then uh, joined Paul Brown back in Cincinnati uh, for eight years uh, with Tommy Pro Pro for a couple years out in San Diego, uh, then his first head coaching job at Stanford, and then, of course, uh, with the 49ers in 10 years of just outstanding football. I don't think there's anybody, as you assess all across the country, a lot of football coaches, anyone that knows offensive football and understands offensive football better than our speaker. But always remember that he was sitting right down here, just like you are, at one particular time in his career and listening to other coaches. And uh, with that perseverance and drive, he became unique to the profession because the skill in working with quarterbacks, and if you go through all of uh, uh, his past, wherever he's been, it's always an outstanding uh, quarterback that will emerge. Understands pass offense and offensive football more than anyone in the country today. And let's give a warm Sunday welcome to the football coach of the Stanford Cardinal, Bill Walsh. Bill? of your ball club. Uh, there's a couple of ways to be a great coach. One is the Buddy Ryan method. Bullshit your way through it. <laughs> Remember the day we took apart his defense, maybe you saw it, in 19, uh, I guess, I can't think of the year, we went to the Super Bowl, but he was, he had the 46 defense. Remember that? And uh, we heard all about it from him and from anybody that even listened to him. And then we shut him out, uh, made 400 yards, 23 to nothing uh, here at Candlestick. I think that was a championship game. Since that time, uh, the Bears went up, won a championship with Mike Dick as the coach. But my point is, uh, there's all kind of ways to, to be recognized in any profession. Uh, one of it is just pure dialogue uh, and rhetoric and attracting attention to yourself. And that one rarely works. I've never really seen it sustain itself. Typically, you have to produce, whether you're an entertainer or an architect or anyone else. Sooner or later, you have to be pretty good at what you do. So, you, so the idea of attracting attention often 
get you killed sooner or later. But anyway, uh, let, let, me, let me draw up some, some plays. I think the more I'm around, the more I come to the conclusion, it's not so much the plays themselves, it's how you practice them. And uh, your method of practicing, I don't want to repeat myself, some of you have heard me speak before on the subject, but your job as a coach isn't so much to draw up new, new plays, uh, your job as a coach is to find a way to practice those plays that you want to run offensively so that you can become proficient at doing it. And that's the absolute key. It's the organization, it's your ability to impart your knowledge, it's the drilling of what you do, it's a way of drilling and not making it so boring that the players lose their concentration and just waste their time on the practice field. You have to have ways to keep their attention and to the long, hard, dreary sometimes drills to become good at something. And uh, that's really the job of the coach. Now, there are all kinds of things uh, really uh, striving kind of uh, Star Wars plays I could draw up that uh, have always uh, excited me. But my, my honest feeling is that of those 30 or 40 different things we did with the 49ers, five or six worked. And the bottom line with success in the 49ers was the drill factor, the standard of performance that we had that allowed us to break through the opposition from week to week. You gotta remind yourself as a coach that there's there's fortune involved, there's luck involved in any kind of competition. And the closer the competition, the more the luck and the breaks mean to the outcome of the game. Also, you remind yourself that there's an ebb and flow to every game and also to every season. Even an ebb and flow to a great season. In 1984, with the San Francisco 49ers, we won uh, 15 and lost one. And one loss is a regrettable one because uh, our friends, the officials, took it upon themselves to call something on Eric Wright, and we, we lost Pittsburgh by three points. But we won every other game, but there was an ebb and flow to that season. Even during that great season, we had four games in a row that were won by six points or less, and we were clearly the best team in football. So any one of those four games we could have lost, or all four of them. I have to think that there was some luck that got us that kind of a record above and beyond maybe winning a world's championship. But uh, I think we were geared up at 18 and one or something like that. But even in that season, there was an ebb and flow. So I remind you as a coach uh, that there's an ebb and flow. And when I say that, it means you can be playing very, very well, flat now, play poorly, begin to improve, and then play well, or vice versa. And it can, it, it can work for you and against you throughout the year. Also, there's just flat out luck that you have to deal with as a coach, the fortunes of the game. And the way you deal with those is a standard of performance that you develop among your players, a state of mind that is developed with the 49ers that was over many years. With you, it could be over many years. The point it is often done in one year, but you, you have a state of mind that you've developed on your team, aside from the talent you have, where the guys are thinking, concentrating, playing as hard as they can, not caving in under pressure, not depending on heroics to win, but simply execute. And that's the bottom line. Uh, we, with the 49ers, had any number of spectacular plays with Montana or Clark or Rice or whoever it might have been over those years. But by and large, you saw us execute. In 1988, we won the World's Championship, beating the Bengals in the last minute, if you remember, some of you that follow it. We had to drive the length of the field with three minutes to go. Uh, we took the field, Joe, really had nothing to say to the team because they weren't interested in what he had to say. So it wasn't histronics or inspiration or heroics that won that world's championship. 
It was the fact that our team had developed such a standard of play that they could execute under incredible pressure. And the pressure of those moments is almost mind-boggling because you can't think straight. I, as a coach, had a hell of a time trying to think straight with the tremendous noise, the tremendous pressure, and realizing, in that case, it was the last game I would coach for the 49ers. And we depended totally on execution and on a plan. And maybe I can talk about that, then I'll draw some stuff up. But the execution meant that each guy enveloped himself in his own thoughts. He wasn't worried about talking to anybody else. He listened to Joe in the huddle. He, his mind would be working as he came through the line of scrimmage. And when the ball was snapped, he'd execute because he practiced and rehearsed those things for years. The plays we ran were plays that were part of a plan to beat people in the last fading moments of a game. Those were devised over a period of years, and there wasn't one play called that called for a heroic play by Jerry Rice or a sensational play by, by John Frank or whoever it might have been. It was simply execute. And so that's the essence of coaching. I think in that play there were, I believe, nine plays in that drive, maybe 11, I can't remember for sure. Every one of them was a conventional play. Every one of them was a high percentage conventional play designed for most likely a short game. So it meant that we would go the length of the field on eight and nine yard gains and use the clock as we did it and have the confidence when the time came as we got to the goal line that we would have something ready to win with. These things had been practiced and practiced and practiced. So Bubba Harris knew exactly what to do when the play would be called. Montana knew what to do and not a goddamn word was really said. Joe, was an incredible performer, just prior to the winning play, had hyperventilated, trying to call the signals because of the noise of the crowd and having to do this continuously for seven straight plays. He looked at me from 40 yards away and did like this. I went like that. So you can see that even in that situation, the greatest player that we have seen was still disciplined to work within the framework of what we did. He was still following a plan as to when we would call a timeout. I didn't know he hyperventilated, but the tremendous uh, courage this man has, he does this, I do this, he figures he's got to keep going. He can't even talk, he's about to faint. He takes as much time as he can in the huddle before he calls the snap count, picks up, throws a complete pass to Jerry Rice. So this is the discipline you develop over years and the standard of performance. Every one of those plays was very simple until the last one. The last one broke their coverage wide open when they needed to touch down with John Taylor. And I can draw that one up right now. But the point is, that's what it takes. So it may be the buddy Ryan's in the world, but the key for you is to remind yourself that it takes patience and organization and concentration on your part to find ways to drill the given individual plays. Find ways to do that where you keep the concentration of the team <coughs> and that concentration in itself keeps their interest. So execution becomes critical. <coughs> so let me draw you that play. Sort of fun because uh, we've used it since at Stanford. <laughs> without great results. <laughs> what we did on that drive, is this okay? Yeah. What we did on that drive was keep our basic offensive unit in. These are all, all our terms. Keep our basic offensive unit in the game so that the bagels bless their hearts, wouldn't put in their nickel defense. Because their nickel defense was good, their added defensive back was outstanding, they 
put a pass rusher in that we'd had a hard time blocking. So <coughs> as we've done in other cases, we had a basic formation in the game, and we didn't come up with anything new. In other words, people would think if you have, if you're about to play for the world's championship, you better come up with something that they can't handle to win it. Well, in this case, we wanted them in the defense we knew they'd be in. We didn't want to show them any different formation because they may make an adjustment that we wouldn't account for. We didn't want to let them change their percentages of what they did. So we worked with a split end and a flanker, got in a slot formation on a couple of plays, had two backs in the backfield, and played fundamental football to win the world's championship. We had done the same earlier against the Miami Dolphins, if some of you remember right, and then same later against the Denver Broncos. But the point is, uh, we did not smart ourselves, and we didn't let them outsmart us. But when, when they would get to the 10-yard line, they automatically went into a, a double coverage zone, in which these two people would basically be responsible for the outside receiver to their side. Uh, we've all seen it. These two men would be responsible for the tight end. If you release inside, he'd cover it. If you release outside, he'd cover it. He'd go to the hook. So that's a simple defense that people run. And typically, the weak side backer would blitz. This, this uh, linebacker would have this back Unless you broke to the outside, then they'd turn him over to him. If you broke the inside, he'd keep him and wall him off so he couldn't get past him. So, a very fundamental defense. We brought our tight end, John Taylor, to this position, so this man couldn't hold him up. They don't practice against that look. Teams don't, especially when they think it's going to be a pass. They practice against the split end. So, this man, one of their best players, was ready to rotate. He was ready to come forward against nobody. He was sort of isolated. Then, naturally, they thought Jerry Rice was going to get the ball. So away in motion, he went across the formation, which stretched him and widened him. John Frank's job was to release inside and drive at this sink and pivot the hook in front of him to hold him. Jerry's job was to somehow get past this man trying to hold him up and get into this position, forcing this man to come over to him. Roger Craig's job was to run a curl pattern right here to occupy him. Tom Rasmus' job was to widen, force him to go to the hook zone, and keep him where he belongs. John Taylor's job was to release outside, not out, Force this guy to keep going, and then go right back up inside. And Joe's job is to take five big steps, sit on it, looking at Roger to hold him up. Jerry waving his arms to pull him wide. John making an out move to hold him, and right there we hit. Touchdown pass for the World Championship. Now, that play was designed specifically for the Bengals although we'd use it against the Rams who'd run the same defects uh, as this before. But if you'll notice when the Dallas Cowboys played the 49ers this year, one of their easy touchdowns was throwing to this man on this exact play. But this man hooked as we normally do. So that play was taken right out of our playbook and beat the 49ers. But that was our halfback curl. So this play won it, but until that time, we ran plays that were very simple and the execution was there. So now, you have to think about how you get it done. Number one, isolate those things that you believe in you want to do. They better be simple. You better count heavily on execution. Then the tough job is how the hell do I practice those plays. Well, a critical factor is obviously the 
size of your staff, it might be just you and another guy, what you can get done. But what we did, what we've done over a period of years is isolate the skills that a man must learn to play for you. And then teach those from the freshman or junior high school, if, if, if you have that kind of program, which you know is very common in other parts of the country, the junior high program and the varsity and junior varsity programs teach those same skills. Now, with the 49ers, Bob McKittrick is one of probably the best offensive line coach I've ever seen, along with, of course, Zoom White out of the Raiders. <laughs> his name is Mike. We call him Zoom because of his activities after everyone goes to bed. <laughs> but uh, but uh, Bob had isolated 32 skills in the National Football League for his offensive line. My guess is you'll, uh, you'll find six skills. But the point is, through years of development, we had refined every basic play we run, every defense that's most likely to be seen, or defensive technique. And then we, we decided we had to drill that in practice. Now how in the hell can you drill 32 skills? Well, as some of you may know, I've spoken with <coughs> before, every minute of every practice is accounted for. Every minute of every practice, every play of every practice is scripted. At Stanford, when we go to start our uh, summer and fall camp, we'll have approximately three weeks before we play. Every play that is called in every practice will have done, will have been, will have been decided upon and documented. And the minute we pull the practice out, that play has been scripted, and that's how detailed it is. It's easy to do, believe it or not, but that's how detailed you get. So you know what you're going to do every second. To us, one play is one minute of practice. So if we have a 10-minute drill for a team, we run script 10 plays. If we run those kinds of plays often, we might slip in two, two repeats along the way. But it's a minute of play. You have a 12-minute drill, you have 12 plays, basically. That's the way we do it. But in isolating those skills, we then decide how much time Bob has to teach us. And let's just say that Bob had, I just throw it out, 600 minutes to teach 32 skills. We know that because we set up our practice, we know exactly how many minutes we're going to give to fundamental work every day. So we're doing it with Stanford, the same thing. So Bob knows he's got 40 minutes in the morning practice and 20 minutes in the afternoon practice to work on those skills. He also knows that any time he works on a skill for less than 10 minutes, he's almost wasting his time unless it's the day before the game or something. So we know he knows he's got to give 10 minute blocks to each skill. So he decides which, how much time to give the skills by having priority. Prioritize it. And then you set them into your general plan. So Bob is going to work on a short trap. He's going to work on a long trap. He's going to work on a Bob sweep. He's going to work on a, on a uh, seal block that day with his guards. And so the short trap's gonna get 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes. So when he has it all up, he can tell you exactly how many minutes he's gonna have for every skill by the time training camp's over. So we've isolated those skills. Now in your case, there won't be as many, that's for sure, but what the hell would you teach? Just think for a minute, your offensive line, what, what would you want them to be able to do? And you probably think of about, well, he's got a, we're going to base block, that's for sure. We're going to base block, and then after we've 
control the guy if we can. We'll come off on a linebacker. So that's a plug block. We're going to gap block down. We're going to trap. And on a sweep, we're going to pull the guard. Well, we've talked about a number of skills and how the hell are you going to coach them? So the key to coaching is isolating the skills, allocating the time, and the learning how to teach the skill. The only way you teach it is it's something you know something about. So if you're a guy that goes from year to year listening to clinic speakers and deciding on a new offense, you'll never have refined these kinds of things at all. Now you're counting on the good luck, the fortune of the game to win, or hopefully the ebb and flow of the game to somehow go on the upside and beat somebody. As a high school coach, I suffered from that terribly. Terribly. Because we went from the split T to the spread T to the wing T all in one year. I mean, what the hell am I doing? Uh, so the key is, at some point, you decide on what you're going to do, isolate the skills and do it. Now that goes also defensively for every position, and when and how are you going to do it. You also know that you've got so much time to practice. So let's just say you have 14 practices and they're two hours long. You then divide on fundamental work, obviously, on group work, on teamwork. So now when you get to teamwork, you start thinking about it. How can you keep it interesting? Well, one of the ways we kept the interest of our players, or still hopefully do, is by talking about situations. One situation <clears throat> is if you're behind with three minutes to go and you have to go the length of the field. That's sure as hell a situation. And so you practice those plays, and the team knows, obviously, through your direction, what you're practicing. All right, the next thing you'll talk about, we've got to practice if somehow we're ahead and there's four minutes left in the game and we've got the ball, what the hell do we do? You practice those plays as part of a four minute offense. So, 49ers, Stanford, we say we're gonna practice a four minute offense. <coughs> and I'm gonna be, without a stopwatch, I'm gonna be calling out the time to see how much time we can use from the time the whistle blows till the ball's put in play. And our quarterback's gonna hear it, so our team's gonna stretch it right to the limit before the ball snap. We're gonna take every second off that clock we can. We're gonna snap the ball on set every time so there's no chance that we'll be off sides which stops the clock. We're gonna run plays where there's very little likelihood of a holding penalty. And of course, we're not going out of bounds. We're not throwing an incomplete pass. If, the, if we are forced to pass, the quarterback will run with the ball before he'll take a chance on the completion because, of course, the clock stops. In, the, uh, in our bowl game of two years ago against Penn State, believe it or not, we went into this offense <coughs> at the start of the second half because Penn State just didn't seem to be able to handle our defense at all. And we, I decided, to take every goddamn second off that clock I could, starting at the start of the third quarter. And we sort of collected our thoughts, went into this mode, and Stenstrom began to hold his team at the line and watch the clock and snap the ball. Our alums were tragically disturbed with the, with the appearance that our team was totally fatigued at that point and could hardly keep their feet, where in fact, we were taking every minute off the clock. Well, we ended up scoring, I think a couple more times that won the game going away, but the point is, that is a contingency plan that you practice so that your team knows it. How many, having been a brilliant commentator at one time, how many <laughs> games do you think are lost in the National Football League because the coach can't manage the game? The coach has delegated everything away, and he stands there stoically staring off in his face, letting $100,000 assistants decide what a $150 million franchise is gonna do. The coach has delegated everything away, and it makes life a lot easier. You eat a full breakfast the morning of the game, sleep well the night before, 
and uh, make everybody promise they'll do a good job. But the absolute key is the management of the game. When do you go into your four-minute offense? And what is it? It's the same as a two-minute offense. It's trying to score. Here's a way to keep the other team from getting the ball and winding that game down. Now, that takes confidence. But these are the kinds of things that you coach. This keeps the players interest because now they're thinking of a clock. When they break the huddle, they're thinking, boy, I've got to do this, I've got to do that, I've got to do that. Or your other choice might be to have just a mundane practice of just running the play over and over and over. The guy's been tired. Cheerleaders are working out over on the other field. Uh, they spot them. Uh, <laughs> and they go through the motions to get it over. Thank God we got over another. Well, believe it or not, with the 49ers, the guys were talking about it when they were leaving the field because at one point, every one of these contingency plans had become critical to them. What do you do when there are 15 seconds left and <laughs> you've got the ball with one last chance to score? And what, just think in your own mind, what would you do? One person would say, Joe, drop back and throw it to Jerry, Jerry get open. Uh, another way to do it is what I had to deal with as an assistant coach when I was with the Cincinnati Bengals and I was calling the plays upstairs and we had a hell of a football team. We uh, had Kenny Anderson and Bob Trumpy, who you hear about now, but Isaac Curtis and Charlie Joyner, just a great football team. Playing the Raiders, we're behind 31-28 championship game in Oakland. You can remember the Oakland fans, maybe some of you are. I'm trying to look for the black leather jackets. Uh, but uh, Oakland's got the ball and it's, and it's over. They fumble the goddamn ball and they fumble it on about their own 30 yard line. And we get it. All of a sudden, we've got a chance to win the game, at least tie it. At least tie it at that point. And the noise is so intense, and I'm trying to call the plays, I can't think straight. The Oakland fans had located where our, where our box was, and were throwing refuse into the box. <laughs> and the intensity picked up in that situation. They were going to help their team win. So I'm dodging everything you can think of. They take these little half pint, you know, they used to be popular, they had those in there. The point is, I'm dodging that, this crowd is screaming, the pressure's on, and I can hardly hear Paul Brown on the phone, and he can hardly hear me. So we called four plays. Got nothing. Game was over. So coming back on the plane, I don't tell Paul this, but I'm thinking, never going to happen again. The next time that happens, we're going to have a plan. And that's how all this stuff gets started. We'll have a plan, and if it works, fine. If it doesn't, we'll sure as hell feel okay because we practiced what we thought we should do, and we gave it our best shot. So from that point on, we had our last three plays. The last three plays we would call in a game if we're behind and we've got the ball. And so we, we gave some theory to it, some science to it, some execution to know what we're doing. So time goes on. At that point, I personally began to develop the different contingencies that we would use or have to use, whether it be one down to make 20 yards. Obviously, there's short yardage, as you know it. There's a goal line offense when they substitute. There is your offense from the, I'd say, the 15-yard line going to the goal line, running with the ball. If you're running with the ball inside the other person's 15 or 10, you're probably dealing with two more linebackers because now the safeties are so close to the line because of the inline that they are served basically as linebackers. So if you haven't accounted for blocking the safeties, when you're on their 10-yard line, they'll make every tackle if they're any, you know, if they're good football players. So 
you have to make sure you've got plays designed to where you can account for the safeties from the 15 yard line to the goal line when you run with the ball. So that is a, to us, that's a contingency. When that happens, we'll have a series of plays we call. They're not different. It's not as though each, each series, each contingency calls for a different bunch of plays. But it's those plays that we select. So as your team gets to the 15 yard line, you look on your game plan for your contingencies. And there's your uh, red zone runs. And now you begin to work through those and feel comfortable doing it. You're not saying, what the hell do we do now? Anybody got any ideas? You know, you don't do that. You've got a plan. And the minute they substitute their goal line defense, you go to your goal line package, which is probably four to six runs that we would have. You might have two or three. But the point is, all these things are contingencies. And all these things are practice. And when you set up your, your uh, uh, practice schedule, when you get to team play, you will have basic offense. That's first and 10, second down, sometimes third. And that's your guts of what you're doing. But you'll also have your contingency plans. So every day with the 49ers and at Stanford, we have a 10 play series related to a contingency that will occur in the game. So this day, it's our red zone runs. We don't want to throw down there. We have to, but we will. Red zone runs. The next day, it's our goal line off. The next day, it's one down to make 20 yards, because that happens. The next day, it is backed up. Now, when we say backed up, I'm talking about when you suddenly get the ball, we all go through it on your own one yard line, and they punted you in a hole, or you're on your inside your own five, what the hell are you going to do? There are some plays that work, some that might get in deep trouble. Your players have to understand the dynamics involved if you're backed up, because they know, you, they know, by now you've educated them on the fact your punter needs 15 yards to punt the ball. If you squeeze that down, you've got to rush the punt. Your sophomore center snaps it over his head. Been through that one. He's fearful as hell. Everybody's operating as they normally would and somebody gets through and forces him to rush the punt and goes out of bounds on a 20. So the point is, you know when you're backed up, you have to have plays you'll call. So if you get the ball inside your five, you look at your backed up list. It could be the same as your red zone list. I'm not changing it, but you know just what you're going to call. Your players know that. They know that the ball is going to be snapped on a simple count. You can't afford a penalty. So it's snapped on the same count every time in crucial situations. You're not about to outsmart the opposition. They also know that there will be blitzing from the outside linebackers, or in your case, you may call them defensive ends. They'll be blitzing. They also know that the safety men will be trying to make a stop. They also know that there's probably going to be gap charges by the linemen, because they're going to call a defense that tries to get after them, I would like to think. So if you know those, those dynamics exist, then you have your plays related to those that you'll call. And your players know it. So probably every two weeks, once every two weeks, we get the ball <clears throat> in the regular season on our own three-yard line and run our plays. We don't even have to scrimmage. It's not like it has to be that physical. But the players have to understand the dynamics of being there and what the requirements are that they do and what they have to do. The ball has to be got past the five so we can punt it effectively. And naturally, we can't take a loss. So you're thinking in, in a very conservative way. You'll have a pass. You may want to fake the run and throw a long one and take your shot. But the point is, you'll have practiced that too. So these contingencies are there. And this is one of the ways you keep your guys interested in practice every day. Because virtually every time they line up as a team, they're practicing something. 
Now, the other contingency in the NFL, which is brutal, is third down and three yards to go. <clears throat> third and three is brutal, because if they want to stop you from running for three yards, they can do it, unless they're you know, a great team and you're not. So you're, in a sense, maybe forced to pass on third and three. If you substitute on third and three, they substitute their nickel defense. If you substitute and they substitute a nickel, then you may run with the ball. So the point is, third and three becomes a critical contingency in the National Football League, not nearly as much in college. Because in college, you tend to be able to run to the three. So we would practice third down and three yards to go. So these are the kinds of things I can go on and on in the National Football League, but in college it's the same. In high school, although you may reduce it, you have to educate your young men to these situations. One, because they'll understand them. Don't expect them to all appreciate them the first year, but I'll tell you, by the third year, they will be talking about it because the minute you bring the ball back on the three, they'll say, backed up offense, here we go. U formation, bring in the other tight end, flanker's gonna be closed, da, 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 da. They'll be talking about it themselves. That's how you educate that's how you educate your squad over a period of years on these kinds of things. But in the meantime, they're interested in practice. And that's the absolute key. Let me, let me show you what we do with three minutes, three plays left. Uh, we had practiced these kinds of things and they'd shown up. And we were awful on occasion. Because when we had Steve DeBerg, bless his heart, with the 49ers, if you remember some of you that age, Steve was not yet a polished quarterback. Later, he's become an outstanding football player. But then, he was trying to do everything we were telling him. I remember a Chicago Bear game. We got the ball one last time. We tell Steve, if this man's open, if this man first, this man second, this is your alternate, throw it him if you have to. We've got one play left, Steve throws an eight yard pass to our tight end. Of course, the crowd didn't worry about Steve, they were looking for me. <laughs> so the point is, it takes time to develop these things. But we played the, the Bengals, I know, in 1987, I think it was, it may, you may remember just a few years ago, when Sam Weich, a dear friend of mine and a former, former player of mine and also a coaching colleague for years, made some dramatic errors in his four-minute offense. If you remember watching that game many years ago, it was a crazy one. The Bengals had outplayed us throughout the game. We hit a couple of big pass passes to Mike Wilson, but they were ahead by four points. And uh, no, maybe it was six. I think they were ahead by six points. At the end of the game, they had the ball. And Sam made some critical errors in his four-minute offense and we got the ball back with two seconds to go. Now, all of us had all but packed our bags. I mean, the game was, for all intents and purposes, over. But Kevin Fagan made a tremendous play because Sam had called a run in which he failed to account for that defense I just spoke of. Sam lines up. This was his first mistake by leaving these people open because we can get guys right off the edge and they don't have them out there. They're just not going to throw the ball. So it should have been a close formation. But we were in a basic defense. And they had been running a sweep in which these guys would reach block beautifully. The guard would pull on the safety. This man would stop block. This man would come through and try to sort him out. This man would reach, he'd come through and try to get this backer. And they'd hand off the ball to Brooks with tremendous speed and quickness. And that play had worked beautifully. The Brooks was, had gained over 1,000 yards. The play had worked all year. So Sam calls that play. This man reaches to make sure he cut him off so Brooks could break. But of course, Kevin, is on a slant charge right inside, 
the tackle doesn't touch him, Kevin makes the stop, and all of a sudden, because of their lack of having, basically, a plan on what to do in a list in front of them, so they can't make this kind of mistake, they run a play that should not have been run there. Kevin makes the stop. So, Excuse me. Let's see, I hope I'm not. Uh, so we get the ball. I get you as soon as I tell you who's playing where, you'll know where the ball went. <clears throat> this is Jerry Rice here. So typically, the Hail Mary play is the last play you'll call. We all have heard about it. The commentators tell us. These three men go down, the ball is thrown up, and is batted around, and once every hundred games, <laughs> they catch it. But of course, that's the only play we see on TV as a replay, right? Over and over, a modern shot catching it against somebody. So there it is. So naturally, through practice, we had decided that we would try to get them to bring their defense to this side of the field, for their safety to favor it, and for us to have to deal with just two people and the best receiver in the history of the game. They got in their defense, they lined up, Joe dropped back, threw the ball, this man retreated only so far, threw it to Jerry, and said, remember the play, Jerry just reached up, caught it, game's over, we won. Now this had been practiced. This, this wasn't just something I said, what the hell do we do? Uh, and Bob McKittrick came over and said, why don't you try one where the guy goes over there? She did. <laughs> <laughs> this is practiced. So Joe looked at me and nodded. I said, go. I mean, I didn't have to call the play. I mean, I didn't even have to call it. The offensive team knew the play. Now, had that not worked, at least we'd have left the field saying, we knew what we were going to do, we practiced it, it didn't work, it's a low percentage situation anyway, two seconds to win a football game, but we knew what we wanted to do. So this is an example of contingency football that uh, every coach should account for. Now let's talk about some plays for that situation. Well, you've seen one. Of course, the one we have ripped people with over the years when we get in that line. If we've got three seconds to play, or excuse me, 13 seconds to play, and we're near midfield, the first thing we do when we line up this way, naturally, is throw a slant pattern to Jerry Rice over here. We've done that at Stanford, done it with uh, Kenny Anderson, throwing to uh, Chip Myers, whatever. Three steps, hit that slant on the move, and you've got as good a chance to get close to the goal line as there is. So the slant, and for us, we would take these two, drive them down the field, he start waiting and come out under it. So we'd go from here to here. This man with three-step protecting, he'd set down right over the ball five yard seat. We'd go to him if we had timeouts, because he can be wide open in his own. Now with us, this man is split exactly 12 yards. This man is split 18 yards in, or three yards in the sideline. Joe takes three big steps. When you throw a slant, a three-step drop slant, you take three big steps and you sit on your right foot. So if I'm quarterback and I get the ball here, it's three big steps and then I sit on that leg right here. If I come from this receiver to this one, I sit, I stay right on it, I look back and shove off of it. So that's three big steps without a hitch step. That's one of the skills a quarterback must learn. So the slant should be caught 11 yards deep. That's how it should be caught. If you try to throw 30 of them in practice, 20 of them ought to be 11 yards deep. This man runs slightly deeper so he opens up a little later. So that is one play in your last three. Okay, the next play would be 
one in which you would cheat this man over and bring this man in to wing back position. And believe it or not, at Stanford we've hit it. We haven't won a game with it. But now this man's job being split eight yards, so there's room outside of it, is to get past this defender and work into a hooking mode in front of the corner. So he's working against whoever's out there on him. At that point, this man, as you might guess, is swinging up the field right here. The quarterback takes seven steps, it's very big for small pitch steps, allowing him to get open and throws the ball. The longer he has to wait, the more he has to come back for it. The minute he gets it, he's ready to lateral to him. So that's a hooking lateral. Last year we at Stanford, we, as you might guess, had a lot of situations where we were behind. Uh, and these were the kinds of things we did. On the other side, if the quarterback sees that this man has really been taken down, he has nowhere to go, the next guy is this one will hook, and this guy who will swing. And he is clear. So if there's a problem here immediately, we come to this situation. So that's another one that we would run. Get me in deep trouble on this thing. Next thing would be a comeback pattern that would take this man full speed, this man full speed, as, as you might guess, this man 22 yards, plant and come back. And we'll throw him the ball, jump out of bounds, and get ready for one of the other plays. So it could be we go from this to the slant. But the point is, we're going to drive them deep and try to hit that. Now that takes seven steps and a hitch step. The key for the comeback pattern is that the ball is thrown as the receiver plants his inside foot. It's probably the most underestimated or least appreciated play in football is a comeback. Most teams run it too short but you time it so that the ball is in the air when the receiver's inside foot is hitting. So when he looks back, the ball will be on its way. On out patterns, the ball should be a third of the way there. So when the receiver plans to look back, he looks for a ball. He doesn't look for the quarterback. He looks right here because the ball could be right there. Now this you take and spend practice on. Now obviously this is isolated to the last minutes or seconds of a game. But let's just talk about a comeback pass that we would run. In our case, and when I, when I talk about these things, I'm, I'm not assuming you guys will say, OK, and they get little Freddie Epstein, and I'm going to have him take seven steps and throw the ball to little Johnny Shiminovich. <laughs> uh, not a lot of speed in the Shemin Sheminovitz family. And that's not going not have the greatest arm in town. So it may not be a major factor for you. What I'm trying to do is, is help you look through your own inventory for those things that are best for you. So on a comeback, just isolate this man and this man. This man sprints at the snap of the ball. If he's held up, Within the first 10 yards, we will then be ready to throw to the other side. But we don't like doing it. He sprints for both speed. But typically, what you want out of a receiver is sprint hard, lull, and burst. The key to any pass pattern is a burst at the end of the pattern just before the ball is thrown. If as you watch your receivers releasing down the field, if they're beginning to slow down and check up and break, the defensive man, you have to assume, is slowing down, checking up, and covering. 
So if I'm a defensive back, it's not verbal. I'm not uh, thinking on you know, my own mind, boy, slowing down, I think I will. No, it's nonverbal. It's just a response. So if that receiver is slowing and breaking, the defensive back slows and breaks right with it. So the key is, just before the break, you duck your head and pump your arms hard. Now this is how Freddie Boletnikoff became a great receiver. If you ever watched his play in black and white, by the way, if you watched his play, he gave the impression of bursting and then breaking everything he did. So if you're watching from behind, he found a way the last five yards to, to have his knees pumping, his arms pumping, drop his head in the plant and break. Now what you like to think is at that point, the defensive back goes, whoa, and he breaks. So if you get that defensive back on his heels at that point, you have beaten him. But if you slow down to do it, he slows down to do it. So that's the start. Let me try to, I'm, I'm going to break this machine, I think.